Now we're here in Ecclesiastes chapter number 5. And look at verse 1. The Bible reads and it says, Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God, and be more ready to hear than to give sac the sacrifice of fools. For they consider not that they do evil. Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to other anything before God. For God is in heaven, and thou upon earth. Therefore let thy words be few. For a dream com cometh through the multitude of business, and a fool's voice is known by multitude of words. And the title of my sermon today is called, Be Not Hasty With Thy Words. Be Not Hasty With Your Words. So what I want to preach about is just how we should be slow to speak, and not just and think before we speak, rather than just saying anything, the first thing that comes to mind. And this is something that's found often throughout the whole Bible, where people are just really quick to say something, or quick to, to make an oath, and that oath ends up causing them, to, causing them harm in the end. So I want to preach about that, because sometimes I think as Christians we end up doing this, where we start, we don't really think, and we just are really hasty to say something, and it ends up causing our demise or our downfall. So, I have you here in Ecclesiastes chapter number 5. Stay there, but I want you to turn to James chapter number 1 to see a quick connection from a really famous verse from James. Now, when we're hasty with our words, it's something that... It's not wrong to say things, obviously. It's not wrong to even say, hey, I'll never do something. Where the big problem comes in at is that many people, they'll say something, but they won't follow through with it. And God wants us to be a man of our word or a woman of your word, if you're a woman. But God wants us to be people of our word that if we say something, we keep, we make a vow or an oath, or we say we're going to do something, that we actually do it, not that we just say it and never actually do it. Now... This is something that God condemns, that he says if we make a vow and we don't fall through it, it's a sin unto us. Now, I have you in James chapter number 1, back in Ecclesiastes 1, or sorry, 5.1. I'm just going to read that out again, just so you can understand the connection that I want to make with this. It says, keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God. Now look at this, it says, and be ready, and be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they consider not that they do evil. It says in verse 2, Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thy heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven, and thou upon the earth, and thou upon earth, therefore let thy words be few. Now in James chapter number 1, look down at verse 18 when you get there. And it says this, Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be, kind, be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. And it says in verse 19, this is what I want to focus on, it says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. So it says that, if you notice that in verse 19, it says, be swift to hear and slow to speak. Well, back in Ecclesiastes 5, it says the same thing. It says, be more ready to hear than to give sacrifice of then to give the sacrifice of fools, and it says, Be not rash with thy mouth, let not thy heart be hasty to other anything before God. So the connection is made is that we need to be slow to speak, or sorry, swift to hear, so we should be willing and list, willing to hear things, but we should be slow to speak. We should think about the stuff we say before we say it. Amen. Now, go back to Ecclesiastes chapter number 5. Because I remember when I was in high school, for instance, our coach used to, it was a coach teacher, we called him teacher coach or something like that, or Mr. Coach, because he was like a coach, a football coach, but then he was also a teacher at the same time. Well, he, uh, he used to always say this when we would say too much or we would be talking too much in class, he said we had diarrhea of the mouth. So that means you just keep talking and you never actually get quiet or never you know, keep your mouth shut and just say things that are really not necessary. Well, that's how Christians often are is that they start saying a lot of things that are really not needed or they'll start making vows that are just not needed. I mean, a lot of people end up saying, for instance, when they're in hard times, they'll say, oh God, if you could just deliver me out of this situation, then I promise I'll never do it again or I promise I'll uh, live for you. Which, that's fine and dandy if you actually follow through with your promise. But I'm right. sure people have met a lot of people in their lives where they say, Oh, I'm never gonna. I'll never do this again if God delivers me for, for it. And then a few months later, it's still doing the same thing. It's just when they go through hard times, people want to get close to God. And then as soon as the hard times go away, they want to just go back to whatever lifestyle, which is wrong. And especially when they make that vow, saying, "God, I'm gonna do, or I'm gonna change my life if you can just help deliver me from this," and then they don't do it. 
Now in Ecclesiastes 5, verse 4, it says, When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it, pay it, for he hath no pleasure in fools. So when someone makes a vow to God, and then they don't pay that vow, then God calls that person a fool. The Bible says that that person's a fool. It says, pay that which thou hast vowed. So if someone's going to make a vow to God, you need to keep that, or God's going to see you as a fool. It says in verse 5, Better is it that thou should, shouldest not vow, than thou shouldest vow and not pay. It says in verse 6, Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin, neither say thou before the angel that it was an error. Wherefore should God be angry at that voice and destroy the work of thy hands? For in the multitude of dreams and the multitude and many words there are also diverse vanities, but fear thou God. So the Bible is also saying this. It says, Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin. So we can get to a point where the stuff that we say ends up causing us to sin. Why is that? Well, we don't keep our promise to God. We don't keep our promise to other people. And it says, wherefore, in that same verse, verse 6, wherefore God should be angry at thy voice and destroy the works of thy hand. So if you are just someone who's constantly making all these vows and saying things and being hasty with your words and saying things to God, that you're going to do something and you don't do it, well, it's going to get to the point where God doesn't even want to hear your voice anymore, and that God's going to destroy the works of your hands. God's not going to bless you in your life. Now, same thing goes with us in our life. If, for instance, at my job, every morning we have a meeting about what tasks need to be taken. So everyone's usually quiet on these meetings because no one wants to take the task. However, when someone about, uh, says, hey, I'll take care of it, if they don't take care of it, and this constantly keeps going on and on and on and on. What ends up happening is this, is that that person's not going to get tasked with anything because no one's going to trust them. That person's not going to be reliable. So same thing with us and God. When we're making a vow to God, we need to make sure that we keep that vow. We, if we're going to say we're going to do something, then we do it rather than being someone who, who says something but then does another or says something and doesn't do it at all. Now, go with me to Matthew chapter number 5. <clears throat> Matthew chapter number 5. And in Matthew 5, when you get there, look at verse 33. Because Jesus, this is something that Jesus even brings up. And I believe he's quoting in this chapter what the, the concept that's found in Ecclesiastes chapter number 5. And when you get to Matthew, look at verse 33, and the Bible reads and says, Again, ye have heard that as it hath been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shall perform unto the Lord thine oath. So I believe this is quoting Ecclesiastes 5, that if you're going to swear, then you shouldn't for swear. You shouldn't make a vow, but if you do, you better keep that oath. Well, it says this, Jesus says in verse 34, But I say unto you, Swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, stool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, neither shalt thou swear by, the head, by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black, but let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay, for whosoever is, or sorry, for whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. So the same concept that Jesus is saying here is that if you're going to, that it's better that you don't even swear or make a vow than to make one. Because if you're going to make a vow or you're going to swear something to God or make a promise, you better keep that promise or it's going to become evil unto you. In James 5, verse 12, it says the same thing. It says, But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea and your nay nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. So another concept or another thing is that if you're going to, you just better not even swear at all if you're not going to keep your promise. And that's where I get at with being hasty in your words and more or less take it along the lines of you being hasty with your words in the sense of making oaths. Because this is found throughout the whole Bible where people are just really quick and hasty to make a comment or make a promise or make an oath to God and then ends up being something that's pretty grievous to them or it, it, and there was no reason for them to do it anyway in the first place, but they end up doing it. And that's something we need to watch out for as Christians. So my first example is this. Go with me to Judges chapter number 11. Judges chapter number 11. Now, my first example is with Jephthah. And my first point is that 
Sometimes when you're hasty with your mouth, or you're too hasty with your mouth, you can lose something that's precious to you. Now, the story of Jephthah is a pretty famous chapter, or a pretty famous story, where Jep Jephthah, he was the son of a harlot. And he, was, he ended up being rejected by his people, by the children of Israel at, his time, at that time. But then they ended up getting in war with, I believe, the Ammonites. And when they start fighting the Ammonites, they're, they pretty much say, hey, we need someone to help us fight this battle. So they end up going back to Jephthah and say, well, we're sorry for all the stuff we did to you for kicking you out, but we need you to help us in this battle. So Jephthah eventually agrees, and he goes and helps them fight this battle. Now, if you look down at verse number 30, in Judges 11, it says this. While, right before he ends up fighting the battle, it says in verse 30, And Jephthah vowed a vow unto the Lord, and said, If thou shalt with, ah, without fail de deliver the children of Ammon into my hands, then it shall be that whatsoever cometh forth of the doors of my house to meet me, when I return in peace from the children of Ammon, sh shall surely the, be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. So Jephthah, which there was no reason for him to make this vow, but he, I believe he was just being hasty with his mouth. I think he knew, he wanted God to help him in this battle, so he ends up just saying, hey, the first thing I'm going to do, or the first thing that comes to my house, I'm going <coughs> to sacrifice it on you if you just help me win this battle. He didn't have to do that. He ended up saying this, and it ends up costing him later on, as you can see. Now in verse 32 it says, So Jephthah passed over unto the children of Ammon, to fight against them, and the Lord delivered them into his hands. So God ends up helping them in this battle. They end up winning the battle. Now it says this, if you look down at verse number 34, it says, And Jephthah came to Mizpah unto his house, and behold, his daughter came out to meet him with timbrels and with dances, and she was his only child, because he had, because her beside her he had neither son nor daughter. So what ends up happening is after the battle, after they end up winning, Jephthah ends up going back to his house, and the first thing that meets him at the door is his daughter. I'm sure he, when he made the vow, he thought it was going to be some animal that he could just easily sacrifice, but it ends up being his daughter. And the thing is, I'll give Jephthah that. He is a man of faith. The Bible mentions him in Hebrews 11, and he ends up keeping that vow. It says in verse 35, And it came to pass when he saw her, that he rent his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, thou hast brought me very low, and thou art one of them that trouble me, for I have opened my mouth unto the Lord, and I cannot go back. So he understood what he did was pretty dumb to sit there and say, hey, I'm going to sacrifice the thing that the first thing that comes to my house and come to find out that thing's his daughter. But he was a just man. He was a righteous man. So he says, I can't go back on what I said. I'm going to actually have to keep this vow. So it says in verse 36, And she said unto him, My father, if thou has opened thy mouth unto the Lord, do to me according to that which hath proceeded out of thy mouth. For as much as the Lord hath taken vengeance for thee of thine enemies, even of the children of Ammon. And she said unto her father, Let this thing be done for me. Let me alone two months, that I may go up and down upon the mountains, and bewail my virginity, I and my fellows. And he said, Go. And he sent her away for two months, and she went with her companions and bewailed her virginity upon the mountains. And it came to pass at the end of two months that she returned unto her father, who did with her according to his vow, which he had vowed. And she knew no man. And it was a custom in Israel that the daughters of Israel went yearly to lament the daughter of Jephthah, the Gileadite, four days in a year. So what ends up happening is this, is that his his daughter ends up saying, hey, you got to keep the oath, and I'll, I'm willing to sacrifice myself so that you can keep that oath, that foolish oath that, the, yeah, that you made with God. So he ends up doing that. He, she said, just said, let me do this one thing. Let me bewail my virginity, because I guess she was a virgin at this point. And she ends up doing that for two months. Once she does that, she ends up going to her father, and her father does, it says in verse 39, uh, and then she returned unto her father, who did with her according to his vow, which he had vowed. So he ends up killing her. He ends up sacrificing his dog. Because I've heard people say that this didn't really, that she didn't, she just left. And I was like, no, he, she ended up killing her. I mean, I mean, he ended up killing her. That's what ends up happening in the story. It's a sad story, but it was dumb for him to do that in the first place. He was too hasty with his words. So he ended up losing something precious to him. 
And that's the same as us, is if we're too hasty and we start making vows, then we can lose things that are precious to us in our lives. So it's something that we need to take heed to, that we don't just sit there and start saying things, which I know we don't do that now. We're not going to say, hey, I'm going to give you one of my kids so I can pay a bill or something, but <laughs> you never know. <laughs> People can say dumb things, and it's something that we have to think about whenever we <clears throat> excuse me, make a vow or we say stuff, we need to make sure it's not going to affect our family, especially uh, us as men where we're working. We want to make sure we take the time to not just sign contracts that are going to end up you know, making us lose our house or lose something that's important to us so that we can't be able to provide for our family. <clears throat> now my next point is this. Go with me to Matthew chapter number 4. Matthew ch chapter number 4. My next example is King Herod. And the thing is, if someone's hasty with their words, it can also bring harm to others. And that's what we see in this chapter in Matthew 14. John the Baptist was a really great man. The Bible says he was the greatest man, man that ever lived or born that was born among women. Well, John the Baptist ends up being put in prison by Herod. But Herod didn't want to kill him because he actually had a little respect for him in the sense that he, he liked his message, he liked what he was preaching, so therefore he didn't want to kill him. But one, what ends up going on, we'll see here in chapter number, in Matthew 14, look down to verse 6. <clears throat> the Bible reads and it says, But when Herod's birthday was kept, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod. So, what's going on is that it's Herod's birthday, and the woman that he married, which I believe this is his brother's wife, and John the Baptist preached against him saying, hey, you should be marrying your brother's wife, but he ended up doing it anyway. Well, her daughter ends up dancing for Herod, and Herod just likes this dance. Now, we don't know what type of dance she danced, but it was something that got him interested that he ends up making a dumb vow. If you look down at verse 7, it says, Whereupon he promised with an oath to give her whatsoever she would ask. So she must have danced really well for him to say, I'll give you whatever you ask. And if you read other passages, she's, it says that he would give her even up, I believe, until half, uh, up to half of the kingdom. So it says this, and she being before instructed of her mother said, give me here John the Baptist's head in a charger. So her mom ends up, they consult with each other, and she says, hey, kill John the Baptist. I want his head in the charger. And it says this, and the king was sorry, nevertheless, for the oath sake, and them which sat with him at me, he commanded it to be given her. And he sent and beheaded John in prison. And his head was brought in a charger and given to the damsel, and she brought it to her mother. And his disciples came and took up the body and buried it, and went and told Jesus. So what ends up happening is this, is that <clears throat> John the Baptist, to keep the oath that he made, Herod didn't want to kill John the Baptist. He actually wanted to keep John the Baptist alive. The Bible even says he was sorry about it, but he says, nevertheless, for the oath's sake. Now, John the Baptist wasn't a, or not John the Baptist, sorry. Herod was not a saved man. Herod was not a godly person. Herod was a wicked person, but even he knew that if he made a promise, he had to keep that promise. And we see that in this passage that it says, nevertheless, for the oath's sake, he ends up beheading John the Baptist. So the same thing with us, you know. If we're going to make an oath, we can see the example of a wicked person, a person who's an evil person, is still willing to keep their oath when they say something wrong. Well, we need to be the, the same way. that If we make an oath, we say something, we're going to do something, then we do it. And so we can actually have some character and integrity about ourselves. Now, the thing is, with this passage, John the Baptist, he ends up getting affected, even though he had nothing to do with the oath. And that happens a lot of the time, where someone will get in a contact with someone, or they'll, make, they'll start saying things, or make a vow with someone, and then other people are affected. For instance, sometimes I think about like drug dealers or people in gangs. A lot of the time, when they end up making, you know, they end up getting in a gang, it's really hard to get out. I mean... And sometimes it affects their family in the sense that other gangs, once you're in this gang, once you make that oath to say, hey, you're part of such and such gang, your family gets affected. They'll start, if another rival gang knows what's going on or sees what's going on, that you're in their rival gang, or if you're in a gang against their gang, then they can go and target your family. So it's just not even smart to join something like that or make an oath where you know your family's going to be affected. And same thing if you're making an oath with as a working man. You shouldn't just make some contract with someone that you know it's going to affect your family or that you're going to lose all this money off of that you won't be able to provide for your family. So it's just something to think about that if you make an oath that when you, you shouldn't be hasty with your words because it, it could harm others. 
harm your family, it can harm your loved ones, it can harm people you care about. Now my next point is this, go with me to Matthew 26, Matthew 26. So we saw that, first of all, if you make a vow, or if you're hasty, too hasty with your words, you don't think about what you say, it can affect people, it can affect something that, or someone that's precious to you. But not only that, it can affect people or harm other people in your lives. So people who have nothing to do with that vow, if you're just, if you're not careful. Well, it says this, and the next example is with Peter, and it says uh, in Matthew 26, or my point is this, is that if you're hasty with your words, it's going to bring you shame. It can bring shame onto you. Now, this is the story about Jesus, and right before he's crucified, he ends up talking to his disciples, and he says this in verse 31, Then saith Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. So Jesus says this, that all of them, all of his disciples are going to be offended that night because it's written in the Bible. And this, he's quoting Zechariah 13, 7, where he says, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. So the concept is this, if you take out the leadership, then usually everyone under the leadership is going to fall apart. So that's why if something does happen to a leader, churches, I believe, should have people who are willing to be able to step up in case the leader is away, or in a sense that someone, you need people there, just people who are ready that if something does happen to the leader, that someone can just step in and continue the work of God. That's another sermon in and of itself. But what uh, happens is this, look down at verse 32, it says, but after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. So Peter says this in verse 33, Peter answered and said unto him, though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet I will never be offended. So uh, Paul, or sorry, Peter opens his mouth really wide. He says, yeah, though all men are going to be offended of you, because of thee, yet I will never be offended. So he's saying, I'm never going to be offended by what you said. And Jesus says in verse 34, Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, verily I say unto thee, that this night before the cock crow, that thou, thou shalt deny me thrice. Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet I will not deny thee. Likewise also said all the disciples. So when people are quick and hasty to make comments like this saying oh i'm never going to be offended well later on you see that they end up getting offended or when persecutions arises they get offended and they're they're one of the first people to fall and not only that it becomes contagious because if you see in verse 35 it says this peter said unto him though i die with thee yet i will not not deny thee and it says likewise also said all the disciples so all the disciples are following peter saying yeah we're never going to deny you we're not going to be offended so on and so forth but let's see what actually happens. It says in verse, uh, look down at verse 69 of this passage. It's verse 69, and the Bible reads in verse 69, Now Peter sat without in the, pl the palace, and a damsel came unto him, saying, Thou also wast with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied before them all, saying, I know not what thou sayest. So, Peter is already denying Jesus. I mean, later on in the past, we see the same person that says, yet I will never be offended because of thee, is the same person that ends up being offended because of Jesus Christ. It says in verse 71, it says, And when he was gone out into the porch, another maid saw him and said unto them that were there, This fellow was also with Jesus of Nazareth. And again, he denied. And look at this closely in verse uh, 72 it says and again he denied with an oath I do not know the man so he's making another mistake that he's sitting there making another oath saying you know I promise I don't know this guy so he's already told Jesus I'm not going to be offended of by you but then he's going and saying making another oath with ungodly people saying that oh I, I don't know this man so he's already making too many mistakes in his life right. so that's in verse 73 and after a while came Unto him they that stood by and said to Peter, Surely thou also art one of them, for thy speech bewrayeth thee. Then began he to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the man, and immediately the cock crew. And Pete, Peter remembered the words of Jesus which he said unto which said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice, and he went out and wept 
bitterly. So we can see in this passage the same thing. When Peter was hasty with his words, what did it end up doing? It ended up bringing him shame. He ended up being embarrassed because he's sitting there being, you know, having diarrhea of the mouth, saying that I'm going to follow you, I'm going to not be offended, but then he's the same one who ends up being offended and the same one who ends up denying Christ. And he ends up going out and weeping bitterly. So he's, he's shamed, he's sad about it, he's embarrassed that he didn't actually keep what he said or, or he didn't actually follow through what he, what he said. Now, nothing was wrong with him saying that. Nothing was even, I don't think it was him, with him saying that I'm not going to be offended of you, I'm going to follow you even till death. But where the issue comes in at is that he didn't keep his end of the bargain. He didn't actually follow through with his promise of following Jesus even unto death. He didn't do that, and that's why he's embarrassed. And that happens with a lot of people. I remember back in um, <clears throat> 2016 at Barry when they had the big homo protest and all the homos ended up coming and protesting the church. Well, there are a lot of people who may have not said anything and they ended up leaving the church, but then there are other people who prior to that event, they said, oh, I'm not going to leave the church. This church is my home church. I plan on being here for the rest of my life. But then when the persecution actually came, then that person, those people left the church. And that's not right. You know, if you're going to say you got to stick with someone, you need to stick through both the good times and the bad times. And Peter wasn't willing to do that. And many people are like that. You know, even at Faithful Word, I've been going there for a little bit over two years or two and a half years. And I've seen many people that they would come into the church. They're like the church's biggest cheerleader. And then... Months later, they end up leaving the church. Oh, I'm never going to leave here. And then they end up leaving. Or they'll end up saying, this is the best church in the world. And then they end up leaving. <laughs> it's just like, usually the people who have the biggest mouths are usually the ones who end up not following through with their promise or their oath. Or just, they, they're the ones when persecution arises or they have a problem at the church, they're the first ones to end up leaving. Now, we shouldn't be like that. Either you shouldn't say anything at all. Or if you're going to say something like that, oh, I'm never going to leave the church, then don't leave, you know, right. unless things happen. But you just shouldn't even say something like that in the first place, so you won't have egg on your face when, when something does happen and it's, you end up leaving. <coughs> now go with me to Acts chapter number 23, Acts 23. Now my last point is this, is that being hasty with your words can cause you to look dumb. And that, it's that simple. For instance, the Jews in this passage, they end up looking really dumb. They want, they're out for blood, for the blood of Paul. They want to kill Paul. They want Paul dead. And they end up making an oath that I think is a really dumb oath. Now, if you look down at verse 19, what ends up happening is Paul's pretty much like in prison or in war, and his nephew ends up coming and seeing, um, and ends up telling him that the Jews have just made an oath. And they end up telling the captain um, about the oath. And it says in verse 19, Then the chief captain took him by the hand and went with him aside privately and asked him, What is that that thou hast to tell me? And he said, The Jews have agreed to desire thee that thou wouldest bring down Paul tomorrow into the council as though they would inquire somewhat of him more perfectly. So they're trying to say, Hey, bring Paul down so we can ask him more questions. But it says, But do not yield thou unto them, for there lie in wait for him of them more than forty men, which have bound themselves with an oath that they will not eat or drink, nor drink, till they have killed him, and now are, ready, are they ready, looking for a promise from thee. So what ends up happening is they want to, they're trying to trick Paul, get him down there, and lie in wait for him to kill him. Well, they end up putting an oath on themselves saying that we're not going to eat or drink until we, we kill Paul. That's what they end up saying. Now go one chapter over to Acts chapter number 24. Because what they end up doing is that they say, hey, we're not going to, we're just going to stay, or we're not going to do anything. Sorry, trying to get more words up, right? We're not going to eat or drink anything unless we kill Paul. Well, it says in Acts 27 or 24, and look at verse 27 when you get to Acts 24. It says this, but after two years, Portius, Portius Festus came into Felix's room, and Felix, willing to show the Jews a pleasure, left Paul bound. So, if we read this passage carefully, Paul is still alive after two years. So, <laughs> these guys end up making a vow 
saying that we're not going to eat or drink until we kill Paul. Well, two years later, Paul is still alive. No. Now, I looked it up, and I think the longest that someone uh, that was on a hunger strike stayed alive was like 80 days. So these guys, unless it was a miracle from God that God really wanted them to kill Paul, <laughs> these guys are, are probably dead. Right. Sorry to say that. They all died at the same time. Too. <laughs> but making a vow or, or, or being hasty with your words saying, we want to kill this guy and we're not going to uh, we're gonna go on a hunger strike until the, unless this guy until this guy is dead. Well, that's a really dumb vow, and it makes these people look really dumb. That while well, Paul's still alive after two years, same thing goes with us. Now, there's because while I was looking at the hunger strike thing, I was just reading about it, and some people go on. I I personally think hunger strikes are not that wise. I think you can if you have a political uh, or if you have if you're trying to make a change in the world, then a hunger strike is not the way to go. That's my opinion. Mm -hmm. But some people do believe it's the way to go. And I just don't think it's wise because if they don't get, if you don't get what you're trying to, to or if you don't try and think of the right wording, if, you, if it doesn't work out for you, you're going to starve to death. <laughs> you know, I'd rather just make a, uh, if I'm going to try to make a political, you know, stance or try to show something, I'm just going to, you know, I'll, I'll preach about it or something. I, I don't know, but the hunger strike is not the way to go. Because what ends up happening with a lot of the people on hunger strikes, they say they end up force feeding them. They just, their people are so weak, they don't want them to die, so they just end up force feeding them. Because when I was reading, it was like 30-something people have died from hunger strikes, but think of just their, I mean, there's more than just 30 hunger strikes in the world. There are hundreds of them or even thousands, but the people who end up going on, they just end up force feeding them because they just don't want the person to die, and they get so weak. Well, we can see that if someone makes a vow like that, it can cause that person to look really dumb. And I've seen that in my day where I guess some political thing was going on and some guy at a college said, I want to, I'm going on a hunger strike and he ended up chaining himself to something and then ended up, I don't know what happened to him, but I'm sure he didn't die because he wasn't on that list of people I was looking at that died from a hunger strike. Because it was mostly people in other countries, so I guess in the other countries they don't care. But here in America, we care about you. We want you to survive. But the point I'm getting at with is this, is that these people are making, they're hasty with their words. They're making a promise that shouldn't, they shouldn't have made, saying we're not going to eat unless Paul gets killed. And then Paul doesn't get killed, so these people don't end up eating. So either one, one of the two things, they either died or they ended up eating and breaking their vow and making them look stupid because they made... They were too hasty with their words. They were really dumb on what they said. Now go back, back with me to Ecclesiastes chapter number 5. Ecclesiastes chapter number 5. <coughs> we're going to wrap it up with this. Ecclesiastes 5. And when you get there, look back at verse 2. It says in Ecclesiastes 5, 2, Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. So the, the principle in the Bible is this, is that we shouldn't be hasty just to utter anything before God. We shouldn't be hasty to utter things before men, but even more so with God. We shouldn't just say, oh, I'm going to do this, God, I promise if you just get me out of this situation, I'll live for you. I remember I was soul winning in another country, and I got this guy saved. And we're trying to record him while he was talking just to get him on video so we can make a movie about it. And the guy, he's just like, yeah, I'm thankful that you talked to me. I'm thankful that you gave me the gospel. And I'm going to live for God right now. I'm not going to uh, live my life and the life I was living anymore and so on and so forth. So I like stopped recording. I was like, hey, don't say that. <laughs> I was like, don't make a vow that you can't keep. And I had to explain this to him that, hey, if you're, don't be rash and just start saying, oh, I'm going to do this and do that knowing that you're probably not going to keep it. And I told him, hey, we're all sinners. We're not going to all be perfect. So if you're saying you're not going to sin against God and again, and then you end up sinning against God, then you've already broken that vow. So I said, you shouldn't even say stuff like that. I explained that to him. It kind of made sense to him after a while. And we went on from there. But things like that we shouldn't do. If good things happen, you shouldn't just be like, oh, well, God, you brought, you blessed me with this. Now I'm never going to do this again. And then you end up doing it. That's where it becomes a sin. And that's what we see in verse 5 of Ecclesiastes it says, better is that thou shouldest not vow than that thou, uh, than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. So it's better that you don't even make a vow. And I think that's the safe thing to do in our lives. Yeah. Just don't even make vows. If you're going to do something or something's going to happen in your life, just don't even make the vow at all. Just 
you know. Like for instance, I'll, I'm choosy with my words on how I say things. Like my goal, I'll say my goal is never to do such and such. I'm not saying that it can never happen, but I'm saying that's my goal, and that's my goal is to never do such and such sin, or never to do you know such and such at church or something, you know, something along those lines, because that's the goal. But even if you don't accomplish that goal, it's not about. I didn't have this in my notes, but like for instance, with um, uh, in First Kings one, where Ad 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 Adonijah he ended up trying to take over the kingdom, and then Solomon ended up coming in in his place. Well, Adonijah says he ends up running to the altar and he's hanging on the altar and he says don't kill me and he says swear unto me that you're not going to kill me but Solomon didn't just answer him in a way that was like oh yeah i won't kill you he said pretty much along the lines of i do whatever i want you know if you <laughs> those who show who i want to show mercy to i'm going to show mercy to he didn't really say i'm not going to kill you because if you read later on in the next chapter he ends up killing adonijah because adonijah ended up doing something stupid so he was really choosy with his words he didn't just start saying or or he, he thought about what he was going to say instead of just saying yeah i won't kill you and then adonijah ended up doing something stupid and he ends up either breaking that oath or having to 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 keep up with it so He's smart in that sense. That's why the Bible says Solomon's one of the wisest men. But same thing with us. We need to make sure, especially how we word things, that we don't just word things that ends up binding us in an, in an oath. Or we shouldn't even make that oath or a vow at all. It says in verse 6, Suffer not, not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin, neither say thou before the angel that it was an error. Wherefore should, a, should God be angry at thy voice and destroy the works of thy hand? So the Bible says, Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin and that happens a lot of times is that people end up being hasty with their words they don't think before they speak they say things they say too much stuff and they end up causing their mouth ends up causing their their flesh to sin and we shouldn't be people like that we should make sure when we that we choose our words wise and we think before we speak and don't just sit there and start making vows all the time because i think that's the biggest demise of christians is they start making vows they can't keep the vows and they either uh, it looks like the person, when we see them, you know, just as other people, we see them as people who don't have character because they keep saying, I promise I'm going to do something and they never follow through. And God sees it and he says, I'm not going to bless this person. I don't want to hear this person's prayer. I don't want to have anything to do with this person because this person just is not reliable. They keep making vows. They keep saying stupid things. And they don't actually think before they speak. So let's make sure we're not hasty with our words. Think before you speak. And because those things can have a major impact on our lives and on other people's lives. So let's pray. Lord, I